This is Rob Hirschfeld in the December 8th DevOps Lunch and Learn. Covered a range of topics. We talked about Kubernetes a lot. So if you're interested in Kubernetes architecture and service mesh and where Kubernetes is going, 30 minutes of that, and then we rolled into infrastructure as code. And still try to figure out sort of how to describe it in big bucket terms. We, we really all know what it is, but consolidating that to something succinct is elusive. So I want to hear what you have to think. Join us at the2030.cloud and enjoy this discussion. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Hey, John. Hi, Keith. Hey, I'm Derek. I'm Severine. Hey, guys. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, Just as you said that, I got an email with the evolution of the Kubernetes multi-cluster stuff. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, I do want to get back to talking about that more. Did, did um, you see no, the CVE? No, please, no. no. All right, we, we, don't, we don't have to. CVE <laughs> for Kubernetes? Yeah. I know. Uh, essentially, folks had started to do multi-tenant in Kubernetes pods. Uh-oh. Uh, not supported. People have been giving uh, uh, admin privileges here and there, and it gives you admin privilege across all Kubernetes pods. Ooh. So, and there's no way to fix it. Yeah, it gives, oh yeah, it gives you admin privileges on the node, but yeah, yeah, but its namespaces are not tenant. Will it allow, I'm just a quick question, will it allow you to use that privilege to create a similar, the hole in AWS where you create an agent for which you have complete control over in parallel, right? So you, you basically have privilege, limited privilege, right? John, to your point, it's limited privilege, but it is privilege to that particular area, but that allows you to create an instance that you have complete control over and transfer data between the two because they're known entities. Yeah, so it doesn't. So there's like two things, I guess, that are semi-noteworthy, right? Which is in the latest release of Kubernetes, they deprecated direct Docker support in, in favor of open container initiatives. So that's the new API on that side. What was evolving, which gets you to what you want, and I haven't tracked the status on it, is Kata containers. Right, so there's a number of projects actually trying to create secure containers that will actually give you true multi-tenancy. Um, and I haven't looked in the last year to see where they're at, but that's that's what we need. Right, We need support for multi-tenancy at the container um, runtime layer, and it's not there today. Yeah. And and I it's kind of got a lot of buzz, and same with Hyper.sh, and then it seemed to evaporate. Um, so I don't, yeah. I don't know why the... Um, well, there was, there was one company that was claiming true multi-tenancy and I never had the time to go look at it and see whether they had done a proprietary implementation or something. Right? But that's, that's where we had that, the great promise to some extent with Kubernetes is efficiencies, right? The yeah. ability to spin up spots, right? But until they solve the multi-tenancy issue, you're spinning up clusters for app groups or for enterprises because of a lack of multi-tenancy support. So a lot of the efficiency story kind of disappears. I, mm -hmm. I would actually go even a step further because I think that the version management story, um, especially when you start throwing in operators, is really sketchy too. Um, and so the idea that you're rolling out a feature set inside of a Kubernetes cluster that requires a certain you know version set and service set in that cluster, and then you have older clusters that don't have the same thing or can't handle the replacements. The you're talking is, Kubernetes versions, API versions. Not, Kubernetes not. API versions, but also even if you start going crazy on operators, operator versions and uh, well, I think like I think you know that's that's semi addressed in the versioning semantics for Kubernetes, right? And and the reality check is until recently there was no stable version, but you know once you have a <laughs> GA version, yeah, um, yeah. and Kubernetes, which we are at now, right? You're, you're guaranteed five versions back of compatibility at the API yeah. set. Right. So the extent they, they adhere to their own conventions, you, you have probably a better backwards compatibility story in KNS and in other environments. It's interesting. So the, what I'd seen is that people were building clusters as much for the tenant segmentation as for the, the 
protection of the environment, like the, the environment, like what's this, my Kubernetes requires these things, it's this, and not having to have the argument, because Kubernetes clusters ultimately are sort of cheap, sort of cheap, I guess, once you get enough of them. Managed yeah. them. It's, it's got a pretty heavy command and control. I mean, it, once again, it's the control plane is still pretty fat in Kubernetes. And yeah, at the, at the heart of it, the thing that makes it expensive is like etcd, etcd requiring, you know, three nodes. You know, for concurrency means it's tough. Yeah, you know, a three node anything is not cheap. So with that in mind, do you think that uh, this is going to spell the, the rise of um, s smaller uh, or like minimalistic Kubernetes implementations like microcades K3s in an enterprise environment? I think, you know, I think there's a few things that go into it. So I, I think, yeah, absolutely. So, so for certain parts of the CI CD system, right, things like K3S or, or micro KS are, are completely appropriate, right? I, I think the mini cube was always challenging because you couldn't create a full Kubernetes cluster, right? So it really didn't fit that role. But I think both the, the micro KS and K3S kind of do solve that problem. But if you look at the holes, right, where we're still not there. So you know, one is multi-tenancy, right? And, and, you know, that had to be fixed for us to create efficiencies. Um, separating it out by resource types, I think is a, a bad argument, right? You, you have the ability to ensure you have sufficient resources. And so I'll give you a CDN example, right? Um, and, and you can tell me if you think this is efficient, right? So at Limelight, we had 30,000 servers in the general pool. Right. We had another 20,000 in our enterprise pool. We had like another you know, 5,000 in our SSL pool. And so we partitioned all this hardware up, partitioned resources up so that there was no conflict of interest. Right. I didn't care how the general pool ran because it was just delivering video. I did care how the enterprise pool ran. Right. But the amount of wasted capacity in doing that is huge. Right. So when you start doing yeah. divvying up hardware that way, particularly when you're doing it at scale, you're talking about 100,000 servers divvied up into different piles. You, you wind up with an immense amount of wasted hardware. Right. So now we're the ones guilty for for global warming. Right. <laughs> so, um, right. you know, so I, I, I've always found that argument to be. Yeah, so Kubernetes has the, the promise of being able to manage resources correctly so you don't have to do those types of partitioning. And then you got to fight the cultural norms, which is every time an engineer asks for something, they wanted three servers for the messaging bus, three servers for this, three servers for that. And we want to radically over provisioning stuff. And it gets back to the same thing. You know, you're looking at 5% CPU utilization. Um, but to loop it back, so the one big hole still is multi-tenancy and, and they need to fix that to get the efficiency story. The other um, major hole in Kubernetes today is still the network, right? So being able to set network policies at, at and, and to be able to do any type of, of quality of service on the network level. Um, and then the deal with legacy applications coming in, there's a lot of holes yet in the network stack um, mm -hmm. that need to get filled out. So like if, if you're migrating someone from um, a legacy application, they probably have a legacy mindset where they have, they're expecting a network interface for the management. Um, they're expecting one for the application plane, one for the data plane. And we all kind of built these applications on these, these you know, two tier, three tier architectures. We separated all these things out. And, and you know, off the shelf, Kubernetes assumes, you know, there's a network, right? So then you start throwing in multics or other things to make these things compatible with a legacy application. But there's a lot of holes in the, the networking stack. And almost every time I talk to an enterprise customer, that's where they go. How do I solve this networking issue? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can I, I can reflect that sentiment. Uh, I, I've had, yeah, I, I've had developers planning like side-to-side -side VPNs and, and asking me how to implement that in Kubernetes. And all I can say is, uh, <laughs> you need to do that in Node if at all. Uh, but yeah, um, I, and, and on the network side, there's also the the fact that the, the, the CNI ecosystem is so homogeneous. I mean, you, you can have some uh, CNIs that support all of the network policies, other ones that will read all of the, the policies and, and then ignore some of them. So it, you, you're really stuck there and like, uh, 
having to figure out what exactly it, it is that you need on the network before you start deploying, which is kind of counterintuitive to the to the whole Kubernetes um, mentality. Yeah, I mean, part of the magic to me for Kubernetes was that if you did conform to the network architecture, it took care of the ingress and egress for you. I mean, this is right. This isn't this a place where the architecture is falling down for it? I think it's it's not ingress egress. I think that's probably where um, so there's a couple sides of this. If you if if you in idealistically world, right, the, the the pod isn't aware of network. Right, it's something that's managed external to it, and and yeah. you know you've got closed ten dot x address that it's intended to run on, right? But now bring along a legacy application. Let's imagine that legacy application spans data centers, right? Now I need something Kubernetes doesn't provide. I want a, a, a cluster to cluster VPN to create a secure channel between these two different components, right? Well, ingresses and egresses don't solve that problem, right? A service mesh moves you closer, which is probably the right answer. Yeah, right, yeah. to creating pod to pod kind of connectivity between clusters, right? But legacy applications don't know what a service mesh is, right? So they end up trying to replicate what they had in the previous world, which is give me a VPN to interconnect these two services, right? Or give me some sort of a private network connection to interconnect these two services. And then we get into the whole overlay networks. How do we tie all these things together? Yeah. Right. I mean and, and oh, even, oh, even oh, more on the service mesh, oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, oh, go ahead, Cluster. A service mesh assumes that there is a single entity controlling all of the, the clusters that are being meshed together, uh, if you use that for cluster to cluster communication. But what happens when you're trying to set up a multi-tenant overlay between partners? Uh, who controls the keys to that mesh? Well, I think that's actually, I, I don't know that that's true. I think service meshes don't require all participants to be managed by a centralized brain. Um, you know, you, you can't through the gateway stuff simply point it at something else and you measure the telemetry data to act to decide whether or not it's doing its appropriate thing, right? Likewise, you know, Sentinel for serving up keys. Um, you know, you can have multiple different Sentinels managing their portion of the world to basically serve up the keys that solve these things. What, what holds me back with service meshes a little bit um, is they are complex, <clears throat> you know, and most people yeah. don't understand the complexity of managing these things. Um, yeah. I don't know what's wrong with Envoy, but something's wrong with Envoy because the performance hit you take from Envoy is unacceptable, right? I mean, I've, I've written nothing but cache servers and proxies for most of my life. And if it's taking more than a 6% overhead, something's wrong and they're, they're clocking in about 33%. So, you know, Envoy's got some unacceptable overhead into it, and I haven't had a chance to dig into it. And then the third part is, is when you go to true zero trust, you're issuing certificates on both sides, it's, it's literally a two-thirds performance hit, right? So that's kind of the ideal end goal, but the current technology doesn't really support using it effectively. So, I mean, I've got some just fundamental lower level technology things that, you know, it, it just, it wouldn't scale from economics perspective rather than some of the technology side. I I mean, it's good. What what you're describing to me is, you know, something I've seen from early days with Kubernetes, which is there's there's parts of the architecture that are great and there's parts that aren't complete. And the idea that the service mesh, service mesh, I think you're right, is architecturally a requirement to build a real Kubernetes infrastructure, and they are complex. And I mean, it's what made Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry was Cloud Foundry not because of the friggin' containers, but because of the the traffic router in the middle of it. Um, and so I, you know, the idea that we've decoupled the service mesh from the Kubernetes pieces, um, may, you know, maybe helpful because Envoy is not the right answer, but it, it also strikes me as, you know, part of this architectural pro, you know, architectural limit on what's going on. Well, it, what it, I mean, I, I don't want to pick on Envoy. That would be kind of unfair, right? I mean, right. I, I've never, I mean, I've gone to the multiple proxy teams and almost every time there's nothing that can't be solved with a little re-architecture to get the performance problems addressed, sure. right? I, I'm, but it takes a, a systems level kind of mindset to, to fix this thing. So there's no reason on what can't be fixed. Right. I guess my, my point is at some point is that should just, that just be baked into Kubernetes. I like guess it's, it's the network routing 
right? And service mesh piece so essential into, and I think it, I, to me, the answer has been yes, and I've just been waiting for that to happen, but I don't think it's going to be some of the like Kubernetes architecture goes. Well, I think um, Istio, Istio shows up with most distributions these days. So I think yeah. it's not officially part of it, but I mean, like if I'm going to fire up micro KS, I just fire up Istio as well. But um, it, the argument for it not being baked in is really brownfield, right? Is Istio actually provides a interesting migration path for existing applications. I can deploy service meshes mm -hmm. independent of Kubernetes. And then as the backend workloads move, I'm moving just the backend workloads. My front end mesh doesn't need to change. Right. And so whether it's Linkerd or Istio, it does provide kind of a, a way of migrating workloads to where once I've changed the entry points to those workloads, right? And and then remember, service meshes give you far better. Um, control over request routing right. and That's and um, what's we're looking for upgrade paths, you know, whether it's Canary or whatever, than, than you know, Kubernetes does. I mean, they, they are, they offer more capabilities than Kubernetes does for managing deployments. So they're actually, you know, they, they work outside of Kubernetes, they provide more knobs to turn. So I think it's actually an interesting way of talking to a customer and saying, how do you migrate your workload? Well, let's start by changing the entry point to that workload. I, I totally agree. It's actually interesting because one of the things that um, I've been talking to Ed Horley a little bit, right? And he'll say that about V6, right? Most most people, without even realizing, have are, are V6 ready. Um, they just don't they don't know it because most stacks have already been handling V6, and most applications don't care about it. Um, and it you know you can you can then solve a lot of these problems with a with a good V6 architecture and overlay. Well, yeah. well, John just explained to me why Istio is getting so much traction, at least, because the brownfield stuff is is where the folks who are established are are playing. So if Istio solves that problem, that makes it it it's gonna get its claws in it. Unless something comes along that's better, it's gonna be the the solution for digitization as digitalization as the world calls it. Yeah, I mean, there, there are alternatives, right? I mean, Linkerd is a pretty decent solution, but I'm just, yeah. yeah but um, then you it's all, but it's almost a separate, well. a separate technology stack, right? I mean, the way you're describing it is this service, you know, service mesh is a, is a standalone technology from Kubernetes because it solves our you know, multi-cloud or hybrid distribution problems. It, it's, for a while, huh? it's directionally there, right? So, I mean, I think that there's, um, so, you know, the first thing when we're, we're ripping apart Istio was to try and figure out what it didn't do. And, and Istio was originally very, um, uh, what I'll refer to as kind of southbound traffic, direct and, and managed workloads inside of a cluster, not multi-cluster. Um, it's gotten better about dealing with the multi-cluster stuff. But when you start dealing with multi-cluster stuff, yeah, that that um, word state comes back in, mm -hmm. right? And then you got to figure out how to kind of go deal with the um, state side of things. Um, the yeah, so so for example, right? Um, uh, when you get into um, routing, I've got an East Coast West Coast server, right? I've got a user request coming in. Where do I route that end user to? Right. So some of that information is is independent of that. It's proximity, right? Some of that information is is availability, is East Coast even up, right? So there's a whole set of kind of very complex state information that's got to be maintained at the right level to be able to make coarse grain decisions, right, about how to actually direct traffic. And some of that is which API version you're trying to hit. Yeah. Um, but it becomes very complex. And so Istio, in terms of dealing with that type of complexity, well, no one's home. Right. So, so think of it in terms of AWS, right? The, the, the Route 53 capabilities are, are not part of Kubernetes. Route well, 53 is not definitely not part, definitely not part of Kubernetes. It's been one of the yeah. things that makes it hard to reimplement on premises. Yeah. But they yeah. were baked into Kubernetes. They were, they were baked into Kubernetes <laughs> a couple of uh, several years ago. But yeah. So, anyway, I think what, you probably wanted to talk about IAC stuff, right? I, I, I have I have that spinning up a little bit. I do want to, this, I, you know, 
nice thing about these lunches is, you know, we get to talk about what's on top, on top of mind and, and your insights on this are really good. You're poking me in my, my Kubernetes um, struggle questions, <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not dependent on Kubernetes, so I'm sort of neutral on it. Although a lot of our customers, you know, are, are gaga for it. I, I and, want to point out. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, but before we digress in, in much further, just like one, no, go, one go more ahead, comment ahead. here. So uh, again, Johnny, you, you mentioned Istio, you mentioned Linkerd. Um, I want to also put Console Connect on the table of that uh, because I feel that that um, in, particularly in terms of brown feeling, it's it has quite a good advantage. Uh, and the console itself, HashiCorp's console, was the original service mesh outside of Kubernetes. Um, and they've done a pretty good job at bridging the legacy to Kubernetes gap with, with their console connect. Say that last part again. So. Uh, so console is their original outside of Kubernetes service mesh. Yeah. They also good. built console connect, which is a, a, an inside Kubernetes service mesh. Ah. And they, they've done a pretty good job at seamlessly connecting console outside of Kubernetes to console connect inside Kubernetes so that you, you can use service mesh routing across all of your platforms. Sorry, I got a. I never I gotta, thought of console as service mesh. It's, I was going to say I was going to. I'm going to claim ignorance. I, I I get it. It's service discovery, I, and it could just be I haven't looked at it for a while. Um, sure. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. It, it. I mean, I I feel that 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 that's the the service discovery is a subset of the service mesh uh, part. Uh, HashiCorp has built on top of it uh, with. With features that are now um, included in in pretty much any Kubernetes service mesh that that, that is worth its uh, its weight, and things like uh, mutual TLS and uh, and so on. Uh, so, it, I mean, they they already had the big overlap, uh, and it I I, f I just find it interesting how they they, they bridged that that gap uh, to to basically allow multiple uh, environments to connect to each other without having to go through external DNS, uh, allowing you to apply your ACLs um, from a central location across all platforms. Yeah, what I would have said about console is it, it's probably the only service mesh that kind of holds up at a global level. It doesn't have scaling mm -hmm. issues to where if I needed to deploy globally, um, console actually did that way it managed things. It, it did proper partition management and other pieces to it. Um, but what I would have said to kind of bridge topics on, on these things. So let me explain. So my, my view of, of Kubernetes and some of this stuff is um, um, self-centered <laughs> for a lack of a better word, right? I think about this is, you know, how do you operate something efficiently, right? Um, and today, if I've got an endless set of combinations of technology stacks get put together, it, it's very difficult to do. If, if I can standardize and find ways of bringing things to the Kubernetes workload, I can get rid of the snowflakes and I can start to create operational efficiency. Um, and so I kind of look at Kubernetes as trying to say it, it it's normalized a good chunk of what I need for infrastructure as code, right? It, it's not complete, right? Um, how can I bring workloads into it that are brownfield environments and connect them into it, right? Because at the end of the day, what I need to have is op operational efficiency and resiliency. And, and you know, to me, Kubernetes is so far, I'll say this is a big caveat, it's, it's the thing that's closest to where I think you want to go. Right. I, I agree strongly with the it's it's um it's solving it's it's definitely solving a problem in a way that pe mo multiple people can participate in a in a common definition of a service description. It's enforcing a contract between your services. Yeah, 
that and that's the that's the the idea of a pod and services inside of a pod is is powerful. I still I still would bet that in five years we're going to have somebody who re-implements the Kubernetes pod descriptions, the the YAML, but on a completely different backend. You mean like Nomad or like Nomad Mesos? or something or or something that uses. Um, um, uh, katana type containers like like VM 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 protected things with a different networking stack behind it or something like that. But mm -hmm. this is this to me is one of the weird things. And we talked about this oh in um, the Thursday sessions, um, the difference between a spec and open source. Right, Kubernetes is is not a they they didn't nobody's bothered to really write a spec because they're implementing it. So the Kubernetes. YAML and all the definition for the API are being just implemented as code. OpenStack had this problem in spades. Uh, and Rocky and I remember this with battle scars. Um, instead of saying, hey, what API do we want to implement so that the implementation or a what API do we want so the implementation can be decoupled from the API, we're, we're all bound together. Um, yeah. Yep. And I, I could see in a couple of years, somebody coming up with a Kubernetes alternative, we're going to have to do it for Kubernetes too anyway, that re-implements all the, all the APIs or has a translation layer for all the YAML. Um, right. Or right was, good. I was just going to say like, we're, we're going to have to deal with Kubernetes in, in a couple of years. <laughs> that is the perfect answer for the Docker shim uh, crowd. It's like, yep. Today it's Docker shim. In five years it's Kubernetes shim. Kube shim. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Um, I, if y'all uh, sorry to do the the real your ISC. Uh, no, no, no. I, uh, it, it, I I'm I don't have like I've been collecting this data about IAC and I think we're getting close. Um, or <laughs> my list keeps getting longer. Um, but it's it's feeling more and more concrete to me. Um. So I'd love to go through it. And last time we went an extra 20 minutes talking about it anyway. So um, if y'all if y'all don't mind, let me, I, I can share the screen. So I'm the only one with video. I'm going to go ahead and do that. You know, come see it either way. Um, so I'll tell you what I'm, what I'm trying to do, because I keep coming back to this. I, there's a set of principles that aspirationally people seem to think IAC is made out of. Um, and like they, it's it's that has been incredibly consistent. They're not always the same, but there's a there's sort of this, um, you know, what we said last time. IAC is a practice, and the practice at the end of the day has this these core components, almost like a DevOps uh, thing. And I've, what I'm trying to do is sort of fit them together to see where the patterns are. Um, I took the graphic. I'm not going to put the graphic back on the screen and pull those those ideas in here. Um, but they end up being like, everybody says, okay, I need source code as a, as a infrastructure as code component, right? And a reconciler or a workflow. And so what I do, you know, so I take those and then I'm, I'm going back a prince, a, a back to something to say, okay, I, I have goal seeking. It's not exactly the right, um, the right phrase in this, um, it's right. This is this is uh, this. We're back now. We're back to a feedback loop, right? But it's um, oh, self-correcting. Well, I think the word you're probably looking for is eventual consistency. Ooh. Mm -hmm. And what from that you might actually just get end up with the word consistent. Um, cause right. So then when you get down into resilience, I wonder if the, if resilience, and I hate that I can't easily move things in Google tables. I don't know why they didn't let me just shift things up and down. They don't, um, so what, so right. So each one of these terms then gets back into a broader, like, I feel like there's two or three top level categories that are baked in like 
some of these are very you know abstractions having having abstractions in the system and separation of concerns which are almost the same maybe yeah so i think separations of concern is key right i think that's good i, I think workflow and eventual consistency don't go together right Work, workflow is a, a defined thing right um, it is declarative um mm. Would you put it into the immutable part then? I think there's a predictable in here. Yeah, I think they're different mm. things. Immutable is a concept of uh, just like functional programming, right? Is yeah. you, you, you never change something, you only replace it, right? Um, you know, versus anything about workflow, that, that's, you know, it's, it's really defining workflow. I, I, you can think of it, I'm sorry, I got mowers in the background now. It's like Monday is like lawnmower day. Tuesday is make noise, cleaning up after Monday. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Not a problem. I can't hear it, so. Really? So you've got the immutable, concept of immutable, a concept of eventual consistency are in there. I think the resiliency is an interesting topic and in that it really defines something um, that it is really about availability, right? Is, hmm. you know, maybe a better way of saying it, which is, you know, uh, how available I expect my system to be, how resilient is it to network outages, to server outages? Um, and it has probably a couple of different metrics on it. There's, there's the resilience of the platform layer and there's resiliency of the application layer, right? Yeah. It, it's not only some of these like either. separation of concerns though. Like this resilience move down here. Well, separation is a concern to me. So I was literally working on something this morning where, um, you know, so let's say that is part of my workflow. Um, what I'm spinning up is my, my tool network, right? And let's say I'm spinning up a, a new service that expects there to be an instance of um, uh, Kibana with, with Elastic underneath it, right? What, what I want to be able to express at one level is I need access to Elastic. You know, that's my application level um, component of things. Someplace underneath it, my platform team needs to provide or dynamically spin up an instance of Elastic to do it. Right. right. So that to me is really the separation of concern. What's the developer concern? What's an operations concern? What's an infrastructure concern? So, so um, you're thinking probably, something like the, the operator pattern then? Um, no, I'm thinking about, I, I'll go back and I use it. I, I like the separation concerns in the way that um, storage is managed in, in Kubernetes, right? There's a persistent volume, which is the act of allocating storage, either statically or dynamically. And then there's the, the persistent volume claim, which is the act of requesting storage. So the application doesn't need to worry about how the storage is provided. It simply needs to declare what it needs, right? So that's the application concern. And then the operations team or the platform team is responsible for the actual allocation of that storage. Um, right. At least when I think about separation of concerns, that's what I think. Right. So, so that, that's what I was thinking about with operator pattern. Where, I mean, I mean, from the application perspective, you, you say, I, I want a database and I want to be giving the credentials to the database. I don't care how it's how it's created. And then the operator then goes and, and does all that dirty work in the background. I think there's I think there's separate things there. So wait. What, I think this is looking at um, to the, the point I think Rob just made, um, or someone made, which is there's the, the the declaration of what I want. There's the specification that the, the YAML files to do these things. Mm -hmm. How it gets implemented, it, it could be an operator, it could be something completely different, right? So there's the ability to express that I want these these two different things into it, and then how it gets implemented to me is potentially something different because it doesn't necessarily need to be an operator. It, it most likely is, but it could be something else. I mean, I one of, go, go ahead. ahead. No, finish it up, please. I was just, just as an example, like one of the first pieces of code I ever had to write, this will date me, um, is, you know, when, when before SNMP was out and we were working on NMP with AT&T, right? Um, what did you have before that? You had SNA. Right, the, the, the old IBM networking stack. And so we had to write the bridge where someone requested something in SNA. I had to translate that into async, right? It was never part of that architecture. So there's a, a decoupling of the ability to express I want something to happen and how that actually gets implemented. So I, I just, I think it's important to understand the, 
the, the semantics of requesting something and keep it separate from the implementation of how those semantics are implemented. Yes. I'm I wanted to, to... And, and yeah, so expressive, of, uh, there's ex and there's expressive, which is different. This is where it keeps, the, this keeps getting longer and longer. Um, well, so what I wanted to point out since we're struggling with the uh, expression <laughs> is that we've got resiliency, but we really still need disaster recovery. What happens when enough pieces break that you pretty much have to recreate everything mm. and get back to a desired state? The producibility. That's, that to me is partly what the repeatable repeatability is as separate from reuse. And, well, it's in some ways tied into immutable, but I don't really think it's. Well, let's let's take an example, and, and maybe that will help us think about it, right? Um, so, um, um, disaster recovery. So, at Edgecast, um, we had everything located inside of LA. Um, and we decided to do a core router upgrade, right? And it failed. And every piece of the rest of the network could no longer connect to LA, which meant there was no brain to drive it, right? So when I think about disaster recovery, right? Some of this stuff is replicated infrastructure and communications between them, such that you have a path to recovery, right? Um, so, yep. you know, or, or, or you know, Fukushima, right? Nukes yes. might be the center, <laughs> right? And, and what's my contingency to, to, to basically be able to survive that? Um, but I think maybe more progressively, uh, a more progressive way of thinking about disaster recovery and, and maybe a better foundation for distributed uh, you know, computing is, is building systems in such a way there is no single point of failure. And that is the infancy, I think, of recoverability. I, I think that when you go back to the old Cold War view of the missiles fall on all the major cities mm -hmm. in a country or around the world, how do you recover when, and the, the key is the cascading failures at some point Every the, it gets cascadable enough that the system is dead no matter what you do and how do you bring it back to life? Yeah, so I think the the word you use is one I actually like, which is recoverability, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Just because when when I talk about DR, um, it takes me down a path I really kind of like to avoid. I, I'm not looking to rebuild fault tolerant um, computing architectures again. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I. Yeah, I, I would say reproducibility uh, more than recoverability, and, and that hmm. I, like I mean you you already have the uh, the blueprint for what you want to run because that's what you're running right now. What what you want to be able to do is, in the case that it all goes away, you can, with minimal effort effort, build it up again and and have it running again. Right. So the, the challenge with that is, right, and I can throw too many examples out at this, is the part that makes DR tough is data. Yes. Right. And, and so I'm either intentionally taking the overhead of, of building redundant storage of my data centers, right, um, because I, that's the one thing I can't quickly restore. You know, particularly at modern, modern data sets, we're talking about petabytes of storage, right? There is no rapid recovery from losing 10 petabytes of storage. Mm -hmm. No, there is not rapid, Absolutely but not. there is recoverable. So the problem I have with the reproduce, well, blueprints, and the problem we have right now is that everybody just sort of throws everything together. We don't really have blueprints in most instances because it's the whole, don't think about it, just code. Don't right. document it, just build. So, yeah, I, I, I 
So we, we use the concept of blueprints, right? Where, where you can curate the best practices over time and you can grab and reuse a blueprint, right? So I, I do think, you know, it, it's, there's two sizes. Is, is there a blueprint with which to start? Today, the answer is no, right? There, there's conversations we have over beers or coffee, right? Um, yeah. there's knowledge we have inside of our head, right? There, there's really no way today to kind of express best practices for how to do something. Right. And, and alternatives, to those best practices. Um, so the data problem was one of, you know, building your, your, your data bus. Right. And, and being able to send, you know, that, that piece of data to, to multiple locations, either for, you know, different processing tasks or to create DR pass. Right. But that was complex. That took us a year and a half to build. <laughs> right. And, and so can you can you take what we did, express it in a blueprint and so that the next person to go build it says, I like that, except for A. And I might want to tweak that a bit. Right. Yeah. So that that infrastructure is code becomes um, reusable. Right. And, and more importantly, it becomes visible and it becomes iteratable. In other words, I can improve on it over time. Which is certainly in many ways a definition of code <laughs> so well that's right this this to me is where infrastructure is code is is and this is why i was separating the ops dev and process pieces it's it's this you know it's, it's sort of what we don't we didn't do with devops because it became a process piece but it's sort of saying hey i want code like code like controls in my systems my infrastructure Okay, so um, I, what I'm starting to hear is self-documenting. So uh, if you build something, a lot of people do you say you have that. a that is... blueprint. The blueprint has to be documented. Uh, the self-documenting because you change it and it needs to update itself. Yeah. So the way. I think there, there's slightly different concepts, but to, for example, um, when, when they brought in the new VP of engineering and he asked me to draw a pretty diagrams of the infrastructure <laughs> and, and I was trying to explain to him, is that operations could turn a dial and 15 minutes later, it looks like something totally different, <laughs> right? The, these systems are living, breathing things. They're not statically defined and, and most people don't have that mindset. So, you know, when we started writing the, the current stuff I said that we're working on is we built the, the documentation generators into the code, right? Whether that is yeah. creating a network diagram or it is creating the API documentation, um, you know, but that's different than, so like right now I look at um, Kubernetes syntax as how I specify infrastructure as code. Is it complete mm -hmm. enough, right? Um, where I think DevOps is gone wrong, which is not, think about the history of DevOps. We had someone writing bash shell scripts that all of a sudden got a tool called Ansible or Chef or Puppet, right? And, and it made their life a little bit easier, but they're still writing shell scripts together. Um, and if you look at the, the practices they apply, right? And, and in terms of things like, you know, separation of current civil responsibility, right? We don't apply, and I shouldn't say this, obviously there's organizations that are um, astute enough to, to do this properly, right? But for the most part, you, you took scripters and started turning them into coders for your infrastructure without the software discipline applied, right? So- That's right, that's exactly, so this to me is, is what we're, when the, my definition for infrastructure is code has, has started to evolve at the CIO definition for infrastructure as code is I want my infrastructure team to be as predictable as my development teams. Or as, yes. Right. That's, Which I mean, means, that's, that's, that's infrastructure as code. <laughs> what it means. Okay. When, when have you ever had a predictable developer team? I mean, I'm sorry, but there's some real cowboys out there. There, well, there are, but, but when, when I, when I putting on the executive hat, right. The, the developer teams have moved into CI CD pipelines, they have gated processes, they have, and they've, they've had, even if they're cowboys, they still have source code control. Um, most teams now have some gate review process, they have you know, repeatable builds, 
Um, they, they use open source modules and they know what modules they've pulled in. So they're not rewriting things from scratch. I mean, I, frick, I, the, the best ops teams today are still out there rewriting stuff that you would expect them to pull off a shelf. Yeah, it, but, but it, for a couple of reasons though, right? So, uh, so why would they one, do that? Exactly. Right, so, so first off, they don't know about it. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then second, once they do pull it off, most of us have the experience that we, we, hey, this is going to be great. I'm going to pull this and I'm going to use it. And then like a month down the road, there's some major bug in it and it burns us. Right. So, you know, you, you wind, you tend to go back to this thing. I'm going to build the thing I know and I can control. Right. And, and um, yeah, I guess. You, so I think there's a few things okay. on the upside. We've gotten, we've gotten better. <laughs> right is is I think Kubernetes is another thing where your people are much more likely to grab core DNS and try and write their own, right? So there, there's some better into that stuff. But I think the other side to it is is I look at, um, so like, let's just take Scaffold is kind of the, the Kubernetes CI CD system for a second, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about what it does, it, it is going to, um, you know, build your application it's going to tag that application. It's going to publish it to a repository. It will execute some set of container tests into it. Um, it will publish it out to a Kubernetes cluster, right? Um, each of those things is a different responsibility, all right? And so, for example, one of the things I'd like to be able to do is tag all artifacts out of a build with the same ID so I can tie those things back strongly together. But I can't do that today with Scaffold because it's, it is itself a model. Right. It's not decomposed into separate um, components mm -hmm. such that if I want to insert something in, think of the, the Unix pipeline. If I want to insert something in, I just throw said into the pipeline and I'm done. Right. Not, not that I think. <laughs> right. But I'm just saying our DevOps tools today are themselves monoliths. So, you know, aspirationally, where you'd like to have these things as really composable systems, our tools aren't written that way today. And so when I talk about, you know, going back to really applying software principles, I, I mean, also applying that to tools you use to build out these tool networks. Yeah. I, I'm actually surprised I didn't, I didn't have composable here. Uh, that's one of my favorite words. I know it's, it's hugely <laughs> important. And actually I think immutable is, is a key is, is covers a lot of this stuff. Um, well, and the other word you'll see in a lot of my decks is, is, you know, the, 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 I just refer to this workload portability, right? The, the ability to execute across different environments. Yeah. Whether that's Kubernetes or AWS, right? If you have workload portability, that, that's another component that's high on my list here. But and that's what the thing that's fascinating to me about this infrastructure as code is that we we all seem to agree at the very high level. And then when we start decomposing this, it um, we had, there's a whole bunch of stuff we want. Um, that that doesn't, you know, to Rocky's point, my Venn diagram was not converging into a right, into a thing. Um, yeah. but, which is a whole different discussion for us as well. Like, how do we visualize all of this? We we are agreed Venn diagram is, is not a part of Yeah, I don't think even three D is go is gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um. So so uh, I'll. So next next week is a good transition. So we're we're getting close to the end of the year. Next week, I was actually going to go through the stuff that Racken's been building, um, which is infrastructure as code and distributed infrastructure. Um, and so we can you can measure some of what we're doing. But we had a couple of people who are interested in seeing the the Racken stuff, and I'm happy to to walk you through that um, and get feedback on it. So and how its infrastructure is code or not. I've been struggling with that one. Um, and then I was going to do the book club for, um, for the 22nd. So we we're going to discuss, um, which means you still have time to read it. Um, the Phoenix project by Gene Kim, and then probably take off the, the 29th. You're not going to go to his latest book, whatever that one was. Uh, that is the latest. No, the Phoenix Products is his old one. His old one. Ah, then uh, the Unicorn Project. Sorry, unicorn you're right. Project, yeah, you're a unicorn. Yeah, no, that's what I meant. Thank you for the correction. Yeah, Unicorn Project. Mythical unicorns. That's kind yeah. of an important thing, Rob. <laughs> you might want to write that somewhere in the notes. 
for this yeah, meeting. Yeah, that is the unicorn. I'll, I'll post it through the Cloud 2030 stuff and I'll make sure that we're talking about it correctly, not the, yeah, that we're reading the correct book. Yeah. yeah. And if people want after that, we, you know, let's let's look at some other books or we can always go back to the goal. I love reading the goal. Well, if you want, I mean, the only thing, so. Yeah. I think Gene's work around, I mean, Gene seems to have gone into book selling mode. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, with, with whatever is new, he's got a, a, a I figure what it is, I'll, I'll think of IT revolution is this new mm -hmm. kind of thing where it's every week, here's a new book um, to read and talk about. Um, oh, is he doing that? I didn't see, yeah. I didn't see yeah, that. Yeah, there's a, he's got a group called IT revolution where he has like, they do book club stuff perpetually now. Um, and they're promoting different books on different topics. So like Mick Kirsten's project to product um is out there which is a worthwhile so uh, i would have suggested actually i think that the unicorn project's a bit dated we can certainly talk about that the one that i think actually presents some more interesting concepts is the project the product uh, where mick kirsten kind of introduces his flow system which is tying business metrics to dev metrics um it, it's a bit advanced for most enterprises at this point in life but it, it's an important concept which is saying how do we track like Rocky had said something about who knows what their engineering team's doing, um, to which I say yeehaw. But um, <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, so Nick has done some pretty interesting stuff around how do you tie those things to the business. Yeah. No, and I, uh, Mick is great. I've, I've really appreciated the things that uh, he's done. It's, that's cool. You want to do that one as our January? We'll, we'll talk about the unicorn uh, in two weeks, and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring the, project to product in for uh, December, for January. Are you going to do it on a doc side? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Here's the, okay. I'll, I'll post it. I'm going to post it to uh, Cloud 2030. So, and I'll, I'll do a push on that. So, of course, so is, now everybody in, is everybody now in that? Black, <laughs> you're doing this now that Black Friday is over and I can't get a paper white really cheap. <laughs> um, I, I can Sorry. I can I can probably tap a, a two page cliff note edition. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of six hundred pages, that sounds like a good deal. I to got, me. Yeah, I should I should have picked up one of those. I heard the new the new paper white's really nice. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting stuff in in you know mixed book, and I haven't read it for probably six months or so. But um, there's a lot of interesting stories and analogies and things he talks about BMW and how to design things to do that kind of stuff that are. are Interesting read, but the reality check is you could just go to, to flow, you know, Google Mick Kirsten, and there's a whole website on the flow system, um, which is probably a very short read. And, it, and really, it's the meat of what the book is trying to get to. It's just a lot of data about how we got there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh, God, I have to start including the year now since we're crossing year boundaries. And then... Um, all right, so I'll just pick. I'll just pick a date. Let's do the first Tuesday, the second February second, two two twenty one, and we'll make that the next. We'll do the project uh, next book, next book. All right, that'll work. Okay, cool. I like that suggestion. All right, I'm trying to cool. get my reading back on. Cool. I'm on a different set of books these days. <laughs> it's good. I haven't been done. I haven't. I used to do a ton of business reading, and then I slowed down. So it'd be yeah. nice to go back to it. All right, all right, everybody. You guys have a good one. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.